Hi, everyone. How's it going? Good. I'm Courtney Porter. We're happy to have you all. Welcome to the Real Housewives of High Point reunion. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> just kidding. Thank you for making the track up here to the top of Market Suites. Can't believe you guys get a CEU for this. That's pretty cool. Um, we're going to be talking about design from the east to the west coast and what's changed over the past couple of years. And uh, we've got some interesting representation across the country here. So um, what I want to do is go through and have each of you introduce yourselves. All interior designers here. Um, and so what I want to know is the nuance about what makes you different. I want to know where you're from, what your market is, um, who are your main clients, and the structure of your business. Uh, do you work by yourself? Who do you work with? Are any of them here? And um, what's your superpower as a designer? It's a lot. Take it away, Christopher. You have to give me a refresher on that. I'm Christopher Todd. I am uh, originally from Arkansas, but I am uh, I'm based in Las Vegas, Nevada, and uh, we have a an interior design company. We also have an event and floral design company, and uh, we have a team of five. I have one with me here today, Claudia, who is uh, first time at High Point, so she's uh, getting her feet wet with High Point. But uh, we do we do work. We really. We're based in Las Vegas, but actually most of our work is around the country. Uh, we travel all the way to New York, Florida, uh, Kentucky, Nashville, all these different places to do uh, work. So we've, we've worked in a lot of different cities. And uh, I don't know uh, if, what questions I'm missing that you said, but I would say that our uh, what we're known for is uh, being fun. Our clients love us. They always, we retain clients for 20 years because we, we make the process fun, we get to know our families, and we uh, we just have a good time doing it. Fabulous. Kia. Hi, everybody. Thank you guys for being here. I'm Kia McSwain, originally from Mississippi, and I'm in Denver, Colorado. I have a team of three that work with me. One of them is right here, June, right there. Hey, June. June. <laughs> um, we are working with clients from New York, Boston, Richmond, Virginia, um, Texas, Georgia. So we're pretty much all over the place. And I think a uh, superpower of mine would have to be transparency, just making sure that we refine the business, that we study our business, we study other people's businesses, and we figure out what works best for us so that we can take that directly to the client and say, hey, here's what it is. If you like it, great. If you don't, we can't really alter that. Um, because that then takes us down this whole pathway in, in which we're not comfortable. So I think making sure we're comfortable has been my superpower. I'm Katie. All right, I'm Katie Wozniak from Catherine Elizabeth Designs. We're located in the Chicagoland area, suburb in Barrington. And we have a interior design, residential and commercial firm as well as a home shop and a showroom. There's a team of 10 of us, which um, some of the team is up front here. <laughs> Thank you for supporting. Our design superpower, um, I grew up and actually Kathleen on the team is an architect, um, but I grew up with a um, father that's a builder. So really translating the architectural side and the flow and the function into the design side of what clients love. Um, but I like to think my superpower is translating really what they need function functionally as far as the space goes, um, architecturally and down to the finishing touches. Awesome. So all three of these designers have super successful businesses that have survived and thrived throughout the pandemic. And so something that we want to know is how have the last couple of years changed your business? What have you had to pivot? Um, what have you kept the same? And what have you been surprised about? Any of you can take that. I saw it. I, saw it. <laughs> I think for me, I reiterate that refinement is key. Uh, really sitting down and digging into what your um, weaknesses are within your business, what your strong suits are within your business will, will help you and really catapult you and elevate you into um, who your ideal client is. You know, um, we 
we increased rates, you know, when the pandemic hit, I think everyone was afraid. We didn't we didn't know what was out there for us. And then everybody was like, I hate my house. Can you please come? And so <laughs> we said, all right, and you know, do you, are you allowing people into your house? Some people weren't, some people were. Um, there's a problem with wanting a full project renovation or whatever it is and you don't want anyone in your house because it's not just me but there are the builders there are contractors it's it's pretty much a, a lot of traffic and so um, we had to create a, a blueprint for clients who might want to work with us you know this is what we need from you this is what we require to work with you and I think this is going to be beneficial to you in this way in that way and so really taking the time to sit and explain. A lot of us are like, I don't have time for that. But for us, it's okay because we wanna educate more than anything. There are so many people who think they can spend one certain amount or I don't need this, I can just order it myself or I can do that, but they don't really understand what interior design is and what that means for us. And so um, sitting down and explaining or creating a brochure or a packet to um, share more information that was very vital for, for my business, yeah. That sounds like the kind of thing that probably was an issue even pre-pandemic, and it was. right, and the pandemic really just brought that to the surface and made it even more urgent. Yeah. yeah. Okay, what about either of you? No, I 100% agree with you, Kia. We, we did, we sat down as a team, and all of a sudden all this business was coming in, and we needed to refine how we were working, also made, it easier for our clients that didn't have the comfort level. So things, we happen to use Studio Designer and now making it available for the clients to be able to approve items and see the whole list online. Of course, Zoom, um, the presentation packets that we were putting together was another detail. Um, we refined the boxes and packages so every client, all their final fabrics, they get copies of this. Um, and really having a step-by-step -step system to follow. And we're still refining this and working on it. Um, but I 100% agree, all these systems have come to the forefront. Yeah, we had a little bit of a unique uh, situation. We, we have a company in Las Vegas that manufactures most of our soft goods all of our upholstery and things. So we were still able to uh, to get a lot of those things and it didn't really shut us down the way it did a lot of other people because it was right there local to us. But um, on a more personal thing, you know, we had to, we have a, a store, we had to close it for two months, but it kind of gave us a chance to, it's like, why don't we put everything online while we're waiting and, you know, sitting here and and did your customer base follow you online? Yeah, absolutely. And it, it gives us a, a way to kind of show more things about like furniture and stuff like that on there. But it, it gave us a, a, a different outlet and it, it just made us think differently, you know. So we've had to kind of change our, change the way we did things. Well, and now that the, so he has a storefront in, uh, in Henderson. Now that the store is reopened, how much of the business are you going to be doing online versus in shop now? That's a whole other panel right there, girl. Um, so the, uh, right, the uh, what I found interesting about the pandemic is it really taught everyone how to shop online. <laughs> and so our store traffic has drastically reduced because people are like, I don't even have to go to the grocery store. Anymore. I don't have to buy toilet paper anymore. So I'm certainly not gonna go out and go look at trinkets. Well, they you know, do have to buy toilet paper. They just have to go out and get it. Okay. Yeah. 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 That's what I'm saying. They, people now sit at home and buy everything. So it really changed the whole, I think across the board, it's going to change retail forever and the way people shop because people realize because they didn't have any other way to do it. You know, it kind of changed it to having to do it that way. And I'm glad you brought up the supply chain stuff. So we heard about these long lead times on the furniture. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, so I'm curious to know how each of you are communicating that to your clients. I'm telling my clients from the start, if there is what the lead times are now, they've gone from like eight to 12, I think they were like eight to 12 weeks prior to the pandemic. And then it changed from like 12 to 16. So I'm giving my clients anywhere from 18 to 20. I would, I would love to never, um, give them a, a date that 
I can't really stick to. So um, I, I try to increase the weeks in which they should be expecting this stuff to come in. And then, you know, we tell them, hey, once it's at the receiver, that that's not at your doorstep. So you, you tack another month onto that. So it's it's really good to um, overestimate versus underestimate. And I, and I tend to do, yeah, yeah. I think that people, for the most part, are tired of excuses. <laughs> I know that I am. I know that everyone is tired of hearing it. And it sounds like a cop out now when it's like, oh, well, you know, we just couldn't get that. And so people don't want to hear it. So I've tried to come up with ways to get around that. You know, it's just um, to try to make the client happy. You know, I don't have a psychology degree or anything, but I, I do think that uh, I understand when people don't want to uh, be tricked into thinking something's available. So what I try to do is I, uh, one, one thing we do, for instance, is we take, when we pick out fabric for a client, we go ahead and make sure it's in stock, make sure it's not discontinued, reserve the fabric. We know if a sofa is going to need 24 yards of fabric, we go ahead and reserve it before we even show it to the client. And that way we can say, it gives us a little bit of time because we know we can get it. We can say, we can get this fabric in about two weeks. So that gives us a little bit of time. We know we can get it right then, but that gives us a little bit of time built in. And on top of that, it kind of helps us with the, with the client because we can reserve it for 10 days. So you can say, okay, chop, chop. You got 10 days to make up your mind if you want this. And if you want this, we need a decision so that we can get this ordered because if we don't right now, it may not be available. And then we have to start over on the whole process. So that's kind of the things we put in place to move things along. And a little bit of time without saying sorry. Can you do it about you? What are you telling clients? You know, well, a couple things. Um, we are working with smaller manufacturers that are a little bit higher end because anything on the production line that's mass produced and you're waiting for a thing components overseas, there's big question marks happening. So the local upholstery shop, which I know Christopher does that as well, um, anything that we can have made closer to home, less trucking time, less shipping time, more controlled as far as lead times. There's also a couple upholstery manufacturers that are key manufacturers that they're one at a time bench made, which used to be the real long lead times, but they're looking pretty darn good now that the mass manufacturers are such long lead times. Um, if a project is a rush, obviously, we want to look at what's in stock for cases and whatnot, and then really communication with clients, you know, talking through, is this something that you want immediately or are you willing to wait for it? And really having that open communication during the project we try to keep up on Friday weekly updates, but whenever we do it, they, they, they get the status of their project every Friday morning, and then their updates on where their furniture is so that it's not a big deal. We're not leaving it for a week or, or months. Um, what the status is, they always know every week what's happening. That's a nice system. Makes it similar. Um, I'm curious about the audience. Is anyone here first time Market. One, two, three. Okay. Oh, a few. Welcome. Welcome. Has it been overwhelming? How are we feeling? Your feet hurt? Yeah. Did you see everything? <laughs> yeah. no. Saw it all. Saw it all. Saw it all. Saw everything, right? Um, so, you know, it can be a little overwhelming your first time here when you come in without a plan. You don't know what to see. So, I want to ask each of you a twofold question. Um, one, when you come to market, what are your must see showrooms? Um, what do you have to see every single time you're here? And has the pandemic taken any of your usuals off the list? Or have you added anyone else? For me, I've prioritized mm -hmm. visiting showrooms that I have collaborations going on with that are supporters of both my business personally and the network. Um, but a goal has been to get here and bounce around to all the places that I'm not familiar with. I have this habit of being comfortable. We all love IHFC, it's right there. You can bounce from showroom to showroom, you don't have to leave. But it's so many gems that are outside of, of my comfort zone, and I just have to push myself out. So that's what, I'm, that's what I've been doing this market, and
and that's what my goal is for next market. What are you been excited about that you've seen so far? Um, of course, I've been excited to see my lighting line here at Ingala. If you guys go down to Starbucks, you're going to look directly across and you'll see Ingala Trading. And I have a lighting collection that I collaborated and launched with them last year. Uh, we launched that collaboration during the pandemic and you, you would think that that would have slowed us down, but it didn't. You know, um, they, they produced this and manufactured this hand cut leather lighting line in South Africa, Johannesburg, South Africa. And it's been amazing to see um, how well it's being accepted and how much people love it. And it was a pandemic baby, that's what I call it. I, we birthed the pandemic baby. And so um, there, there have been some blessings that have come out of working through the pandemic and really digging down and, and, and seeing what um, my strengths plus my weaknesses were and how we can build and how we can grow and how you can collaborate and how you can work with others to make something beautiful. That's really, really been something that I've been excited about. So make sure you guys go see that lighting. Float a pin in that. I want to circle back to that in a second, but give me your go-to showrooms. My go-to showrooms, gosh, that's hard for me because just like she said, I like to, uh, I, I'm a market junkie. I, I was telling Katie on the way up here, I'm a, I have total FOMO. I go to Dallas, I go to <laughs> Vegas, I go to New York, I go to all the markets because I just love going to market. I love seeing stuff. So you kind of have to pick and choose here. So I try to go to things that I, I don't see and I'm, I'm, I do it so fast, I usually take pictures of the doors and then we go back and research it so I don't really even know who I would say are my favorites. Yeah, it really is, but um, I, I love seeing all the smaller companies that don't show in the other markets. And we were somewhere yesterday, we could have been in South Carolina as far as I know. It was, I had no idea where it was far, wherever <laughs> yes. I went with you. Oh, Varela. Yeah, I mean, no. I would have never found that. I was like, Varela is not there. <laughs> I felt like I was, it was the hottest van I've ever been on. I was like, I am roasting back here. Where are we? And we drive up and I was like, what is going on here? So I, mean, I would have never known about that um, had I not been here and with these fantastic people. So yeah, Grand okay. Katie, what? name some names. I want to hear some vendor names. I'm sorry, I didn't, I just, I can look on my phone. <laughs> I mean, we start out with our core companies that we use all the time to see the latest and greatest. So upholstery, we use Burton James, um, Hickory Chair, Highland House. So, you know, we've met with our reps. We make our rep appointments for where we really want to see the details. But I will caution any anyone that if you get caught up with too many reps, mm -hmm. you'll never make it through market. Yeah. So, um, be careful about that. But we've been on a hunt for accessories and unique finds. So we found a wonderful um, new portion. I don't remember the name. It's a whole new building um, of the antique market. Chelsea, Chelsea Antiques. Chelsea Antiques. Thank you, Jess. Um, we found this amazing music stand that we're using. So we're very excited about that. I've heard great things. My couple of my team members were just at the Red Egg this morning, which I haven't been to. They said there were some really neat finds there. So, so I agree. Getting off the beaten path and checking out, it's so spread out. It's that's the thing. It's so overwhelming. Newbies always want specifics. That that's what they need. So if you could give anyone who's brand new to market a tip on how to do market, like don't get bogged down with the reps. Yes. A tip like that. What was the uh, dining chair? Design Master. Yeah. Design Master, that was one that I, I we've never used them before, that um, I was really impressed with what they had. They only do dining chairs. It was great to see that. It's I love it when companies specialize in one thing instead of trying to do everything for everybody. So that was a really good one. And uh, there's one other one that was just on the tip of my tongue. I'm sorry, I was trying to give you names. But. <laughs> That's quite all right. Give me a tip for someone who's just starting out at market. How should they do market or not do market? <laughs> Don't wear new shoes. Don't wear new shoes. <laughs> 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 you know, I really like to plan my days by building or area if I can. So schedule all of the downtown area during this time or all of the IHFC. Because when you go from building to building, forget it. That's a bunch of time. So for me, my first market, and I'll try not to like drag this out. My first market was in 2016. 
we were so nervous that all we wanted to do was pick up a champagne glass <laughs> or a cup every showroom we went to. So by the end of the market, we were all like, hey. <laughs> um, but once we got consistent and once we really got down to business and we had to, we knew we had to make money, we had to work for our clients. Um, I got to the point where, and it's hard for me because you see people, you want to speak, you want to say hi, that will slow you down. You are here to, if you're here to work, if you're here to source for clients, you don't have much time. It's like literally not enough hours in the day. So like Christopher said, we just began seeing what we like, taking pictures of it, getting a card, taking a picture of the information and researching it later on. You have the time to do that. When you're here, you don't have time to stop in. What's your minimum? What's your buying? What's your this? What's your that? How long is, you can find all that out later. What your goal is, is to get your eyes on what you like, what your style is, what your taste is, and keep moving. That's great. Two other little things I wanted to throw in. Go for it. Um, one, what she was saying, when if you if you do start drinking too early, you may in about mm -hmm. four weeks open some boxes and say, where did that come from? <laughs> <laughs> you don't remember you ordered it. but. Um, yeah, that's, uh, that was just being silly, but <laughs> um, I don't remember the point I was about. Think about it. I have um, one more question about newbies, and then I want to talk more about industry veteran stuff. So um, if you were starting your business today, middle of the pandemic, um, what would you do? What would you do differently? What would you, what kind of advice would you give for someone starting now? I would tell you to make a list of all the things you want your business to be, all the things you're afraid of, all the things that you think you can you can be 110% at, at the business and go and talk to an attorney about it and have them put it in a, in a contract. <laughs> Contracts are important. Yes, and um, to add to that, understanding your strengths and weaknesses, what you can do well and what you can't do well or is not your strong suit um, because you'll need to cover for those weaknesses. You may need a good accountant or maybe a team member you need on hand um, purchasing. I'm mentioning all the things I'm weak at. <laughs> so, um, so really understanding where you're gonna be able to run with the company and where you're gonna maybe some struggles and cover for those right away in the beginning. Know who you can go to. Um. Okay, great. Um, so you mentioned your lighting line, which was a pandemic baby, which is awesome. Um, all of you have been at it for a while, and so you're not just interior designing, you've got other stuff going on. Um, what are those other things, and um, how else have you found ways to pivot during the pandemic, kind of like a birthing and lighting line? Our biggest, oh my God, our uh, the biggest thing that happened with us, we do a ton of event design. And uh, through event design, through event design, uh, that of course shut down. That was kind of our uh, bread and butter. So it really affected our, our company uh, when we couldn't do that anymore. So it's really nice that those things have started back up and we've had to take a different approach because events, much like design, they aren't the same way that they used to be. So we've, we've had to take a different approach on how we're doing things and you just have to think through it. It's uh, everything you do has to kind of have a different path to get to where uh, where you're wanting to go now because everything has changed so much. What did you do instead of event design? Well, what we, this place? Uh, nothing. That's the problem. We didn't really have any. We had fortunately, right at the beginning of the pandemic, we had started a really large project. So it was kind of like, oh, this is kind of a blessing that we have something to fill in the void. But we, we, uh, we didn't have anything to, to take up that. And, you know, it was no travel. It was no, uh, we couldn't do what we normally did. So we just had to kind of be creative and try to think of what, like building the website, redoing the store and stuff like that, just to come up with ways to make things better. But, um, we, nothing really filled that void. It's coming back. It's coming back. It's coming back in a big way. Yeah. We're in 20s. Let's go. Yeah. All right. Let's go, Kia. Tell us more about the lighting, too. Tell us also about um, how you got the lighting gig. So for me, um, I think, and I don't want to speak for you, but you can nod if you agree. I think no matter how far we get in this industry, um, our talent 
and our skills do not negate the fact that we were afraid. Nobody, none of us has lived through a pandemic before. Um, the anxiety of not knowing pulls and rips away from your creativity. And so for me, I just wanted to remain a creative because like you said, Katie, I have several weaknesses. I'm not, I'm not billing, I'm not uh, communicating with the client. I am strictly a creative. I don't even want to talk to you. Like, I don't know who you are, ma'am. I just know <laughs> that I'm creating this space for you, right? And so I wanted to create something that spoke to people that were also dealing with the pandemic. I'm here in the United States, but South Africans were dealing with the pandemic as well. Um, I knew that Nick and Lawson, who are the owners of Angala Trading Co., they were dealing with the pandemic as well. Um, our PR team that we share, Brendan and Kayla of Walmart Inc., uh, they were dealing with the pandemic as well. And so, um, aside from me being on the phone constantly whining and complaining to them about what I was nervous about or what was going on, I said, Let's, I want to create something. I want to create a lighting line and collaborate with them. And I know it's in the middle of a pandemic, but I feel like we can do it. it it's already you know, um, something that they, they've they been so successful at doing, and so I want to partner with them to create. And they said, okay, and so they set up a call, and I shared my vision with them, and they were very much so open and willing to, to partner with me, and it was such an amazing partnership and collaboration that um, I'm looking forward to working with them again, but I can say, if there's anybody that you trust, anybody that you feel like you could go into business with or collaborate with, whether they're a small vendor, whether they're a larger vendor, uh, do it, you know, do it. Because your, your creativity, your skills, uh, they don't diminish under pressure. It's like a diamond, it's right? They, you, you, you press hard enough and you create a diamond. And so I wanted to create a diamond, which is what we did with the Nikia collection. And um, the lighting was just the start. I'm looking forward to working on additional things, but I just, you know, if I could encourage you in any way, it's, it's don't let fear deter you, let it push you, because you would be surprised at the places that you can go when you're, when you're feeling uh, anxious or under pressure. Well, and because you started this during the pandemic, you were afforded the opportunity of time, you had that on your hands. We didn't have a lot of time. You still have projects. We created that. We created that line in about six months. I, I remember we had the conversation <laughs> and then he's like, all right, sketch it for me and I was like what he's like yeah sketch it for me I was like I'm not a sketcher like okay don't worry about it I don't want to do it anymore he's like go sketch your idea it didn't have to be perfect get it back to us and we'll refine it together and that's what we did I, I sat with my cousin who um, was all, always an artist and I, I told her what I wanted it to look like we sent it back and I think they had those lights the prototype sent back within six months and we were ready to go can you leave a field trip for us after this? Right. I could. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> somewhere to a taco truck. This is not book signing, so please stay for that. <laughs> Katie, talk, tell, talk to us. So we actually, and we had this as part of our process or thinking before the pandemic, but we actually opened our showroom shop during the pandemic. And what it provided for our clients is they no longer wanted to, for us, it's the merchandise mart in Chicago. So they no longer wanted to hike down to the merchandise mart or other places to see furniture. So this was a natural way for us to bring in sample pieces. And yes, we can't have everything, but we have a chair that can sit the same as this sofa, this sofa, this sofa. So it's creating this environment for them that's a safe zone. They can be in our area and really design the whole home without leaving. That was amazing. It's worked out very well. And how much time are you dedicated to work working on the showroom space versus everything else going on in your business? Well, we definitely work on it as a team. And Dominique, who's not here, runs it, so I give her a lot of credit. But um, I'm still proud. 90% on the interior design business and then 10% on the showroom, but then the different team members have, we're doing vignettes, so different team members have different areas so they can really focus and show what they want to show. So I'm curious about how 
pandemic has affected the geography of who you design for. A lot of people have been moving during this time, relocating. Um, you have repeat clients who have now bought homes elsewhere and moved away and are designing for them or overseas. Talk to me about the geography. Well, a little bit of all of the above, but we are right on the border of Wisconsin and the Chicagoans have, many of them have lake homes in Wisconsin. So the amount of people that are buying and more so building homes, um, and we, vacation homes have always been a big market for us, but it's on a whole new level now. And the homes are expanding to really hold multiple friends, multiple family for longer term because now people have figured out how to work remotely. So now they're staying there all summer versus weekend. So really a lot more vacation homes for us. Yeah. And where, where are they? Uh, mostly in Wisconsin. We've had, uh, it's a little bit unique because of Vegas, but we've had two things. Some really, our, our existing clients haven't moved that much, but we've had a little bit of an influx of people coming to Vegas uh, to buy second properties, condos, being out on the strips. We've done some of that work, um, which those are fun. But what we've also had happen is a, a $1.5 million home in LA is 1,200 square feet. A $1.5 million home in Las Vegas is 4,000 square feet. So we've had a lot of people from California come over to live in Las Vegas because they're staying at home or they're working from home and they have this big home now. The downside of that is they want to go to West Elm and get all the furniture, mm -hmm. but because they don't know. But um, except for anyone here from West Elm, <laughs> uh, but you know what I mean. It's it's uh, it's they're younger. They don't know the they don't they don't know what the, they're calling us for things. But it's like, hey, we want some new bar stools. Can we get those for like three hundred dollars? You know. So it's it's kind of interesting because that they're in these million dollar homes but the level they don't have the million dollar level and so it's it's kind of a training that we need to can you teach taste <laughs> or i have tried for years <laughs> <laughs> i would love to be in on one of your calls when you're explaining and rolling around and like, oh my god they can oh see, they can see you on the zoom i can't do oh this <laughs> actually in the process of purchasing another home in Hawaii. And so I'm really looking forward to that. I know, right, poor thing, poor thing. Um, I'm really looking forward to working with them. Uh, she's become a friend of mine, and I was just talking to her and telling her the other day, yeah, because you literally designed your entire house. I just made sure all the product arrived and arrived safely, but you literally um, designed your own home. And she's like, yeah, so now I can design this with a little bit of your help. But most of them are um, single family homes. I just completed a 1930s build, which was very quaint, very cute. The couple was amazing. Um, for me, it's more so about them, not the project, not about the budget, but if, if do I really like you? Can I work with you six to nine months, sometimes a year, a year and a half? Um, can we become friends? Will you ask me, am I thirsty when I get to your house? Or just stand me in a corner, you know? So I think it's the relationships which determine um, that next home or that next project, not really the timelines or all the, the cons that happen within design. So I'm really looking forward to some of these clients adding on to homes. Like I mentioned, the Long Island client um, um, moving to or getting a new house in Hawaii and then, um, you know, any any additions, you know. So, yeah, I don't have a ton going on, but I would, I would definitely take some notes from Christopher when it comes to <laughs> educating uh, these younger clients that are getting these really, and it's not just younger, it can be older ones too. They, they, want to purchase these really nice homes and then they're they're more traditional than what they expect and there's a ton of work that has to go into it. They're like, oh, don't worry about it. We'll just go to Ikea. And I'm like, you know, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> I hope there's no one for Ikea. <laughs> if there is, we love licensing. We love you guys. We love you. <laughs> Swedish meatballs for everyone. <laughs> um, my next question is, I'm curious about how the pandemic, if it has at all affected stylistically, you're doing for your clients. Um, what are you putting in their homes, not Ikea and West Elm? 
um, mm -hmm. what, what is going in there and has it changed at all? I was stagnant in the start. Like I found myself looking at everybody else's work and being like, ooh, is that, am I doing that now? Like, it, this is trending. And I had to get out. I had to get out to market very early on and start touching things again and start seeing things and really digging into what, what a lot of my personal style is and what I want Kimberly and Cameron Interiors to say. So um, I think it's evolved over that short period of time, which has really been a long time. It's from what years. to what? It's evolved from what to what? It's evolved from eclectic to um, more exclusively defined. And when I say that, I mean really honing in and listening to what the client prefers and what they like, their style. Uh, I'm more of a, a color pattern layer type of girl and I've been finding clients more lately that are like, yeah, I'm, I'm more clean lines, I'm more blacks, I'm more neutrals and so Finding my creative self, my best creative self within what they are desiring has been a, a, a true journey and I'm, I'm enjoying it. I completely agree with something you said and that is that with... Uh, Was I wrong on the other stuff I said? You're never wrong. <laughs> oh, I love you. You're never wrong. Um, I, I think that what people did during the pandemic is they had a chance for the first time to really scroll Instagram more or watch HGTV more. And I think that trend became more important to people more than ever because they had a chance to see it more. You know, so it was like, oh, I've not really ever seen this show and now I have a chance to see it and now I have a chance to understand. So I feel like, which I'm not a huge fan of trend personally, but um, I think that, I think it, the pandemic really changed the way people thought about it because everybody was doing oh my god I have to have black cabinets because that's what everybody has now so I think that it just started a, um, a domino effect of everybody having that kind of stuff because they had a chance to explore it for the first time okay. our clients are definitely paying more attention to comfort overall just being in their homes more and entertaining more in their homes we are seeing more than design styles, we're real client-centric, um, we're seeing more functional changes. So whereas everything was all open concept before, we're still seeing open concept, but then these areas that are enclaves or private, almost sanctuaries for each family member and designing them for each family member. Add something to that, please. Yes, you can. Um, and, and this is something that's very personal to me because it's my home. I just bought a home in January and I'm redoing it right now. You know, are all invited to come over in a few months when I get it done. But what I did to go to Katie's point is um, I have a kitchen and then I had a dining room next to it, and nobody ever uses their dining room. I mean, you do twice a year or whatever. But what I did is I divided the space up and I thought thoroughly thought through the space and I created a pantry that is bigger than a bedroom. It's like nine by 13 and it connects to the kitchen and then I put these big double pocket doors so that when I wanna have a party, I can open this up and have this extended space of entertaining and make it all this big, wonderful room and the bar is in there and all this, you know, it's gonna be really fun. But then we can close it off and then you've got your small kitchen, you've got your small dining room and it makes it, instead of the everything open, it, it creates a more intimate, fun space. So it, it's really, I, I wish people would start thinking that way. You know, open concept became a really big thing and it, it's still popular and it's nice in a lot of situations, but to have spaces divided up where you can really, you know, sometimes you need a place to throw your dirty clothes, you know? Throw in the pantry. <laughs> so it, you leave the cereal out sometimes. So it kind of gives you a spot that, okay, this is private now. And so just wanted to throw that in, something that I'm hoping to start. Large pantries, the new thing. Large pantries. I'm responsible. First, Thank everyone. you. It was here first. <laughs> That's an important part of it. That's why people need you and people need you guys because they're not thinking outside of the box they're not thinking for their true needs because they their minds won't allow them to go there um but you creating that space is really inspiring because um more people should be pushing more designers should be pushing their clients 
to go the extra mile and not create a space that they're used to. You know, a lot of people are like, oh, maybe I should just put the television um, over the fireplace. Why? Because that's what you normally see. You're not really thinking for your true functionality needs. You're awesome. I love that idea. I would love to see pictures or be invited. I uh, will come on out. All right. So I've had just about every job in design you can possibly have. So I just say yes to everything. Um, but really my bread and butter, what I do is digital rebrands for designers and furniture companies and showrooms. And uh, that includes websites, social media, all of that. And so I always want to hear from designers what role does social media play in each of your businesses? And do you find it, uh, it helps or is it a hindrance? I am not extremely strong in social media. Um, I've not hired anyone to hone in on my social media because I guess I don't depend on it. Um, I find social media as a place for me to uh, vent, not in a bad way, not in a negative way, but vent about projects and things that really excite me. Um, and I don't share a ton of work. Um, I share the things that catch my eye. And if leads or clients want to see work, we share our portfolios. But, but social media, to me, um, is something different. And it's not a priority for me. But I love the fact that it, it works so well for other people, bringing the clientele, um, being monetized, but it's not a strong suit for me. It's actually really refreshing to hear because everyone's so obsessed with it, but there's a million other things you can do in the digital yeah. space anyways. Um, I'm curious to know where most of your clients find you from. So our clients find us through the Black Interior Designers Network or either through word of mouth. Uh, they are either intentionally seeking out a Black Interior Designer or they um, are friends with previous clients that we've worked with. Also, tell us about Black Interior Designers Network real fast. Get a little plug yeah, in there. So the Black Interior Designers Network was founded in 2010 to create resources for Black Interior Designers that we don't really have here in the industry. And uh, when the founder passed, the late founder passed in 2017, I took the helm as the president. And we're growing and we're making uh, partnerships and uh, collaborating. And um, it's, it's been an amazing journey. Hey Katie, what about you? So for us, social media is mostly focused on our past or current clients. So they keep up with us and what we're doing and they get excited, they think of us. It's almost a way to keep top in their mind when they need something. Um, we as well don't get much new business off of social media. Ours is more from word of mouth, um, the ASID, magazine articles, so being visible in the community. Um, magazine articles, uh, what types of publications are you in and where do you hear clients are coming from? Well, actually the local magazines versus the national because everyone is receiving a copy of that local magazine. Um, so we have, there's a couple in our area that compete, but I know everyone gets a copy and they actually read it because it has community news in it and it's beautifully printed. I mean, it's printed as well as a Lux magazine is printed. So um, that's primarily what people say. I just want to back her up on that and reiterate that's a very common story. So mm -hmm. if you are a designer looking to get published, um, obviously Art Digest, shoot for the moon. But mm -hmm. um, at the end of the day, your local publications would be much more beneficial if the goal is just to get more design clients. We, um, I don't depend on social media at all. My, um, my Instagram is mainly about my dogs or things that are fun. I started, I had someone that was doing it for me and it was all about product and things like that. I was like, this is so boring. I wouldn't want to see it. It would be something I would scroll by. And so I took it back over and started making it about my store, my business, my life, everything combined. And it, to me, it seemed a little bit, not a lot more interesting, but a little more interesting. And uh, I'm not one, as Jess, who does my PR, knows, I'm not one to take a lot of pictures. I don't share pictures of my clients' homes. It's their homes, it's not my house. So I'm very yeah. weird about that, and I just don't, I don't, I don't do it. And so um, our work really comes from uh, mainly about two or three sources. We've got a really good 
a real estate agent that's my friend and he sends people our way and it's word of mouth and you know if you always do good the word gets around if you do bad it gets around as well so we try to always just do our best and i feel like you can just say instagram because that's all that really matters anymore i feel like it's kind of like you know in, in high school you know you got to be popular and it's everybody wants to be popular and oh my god and then when you get out of high school it really doesn't matter with numbers and that's kind of what i feel like instagram is going to it's like the gig is up you know it's like everybody knows when you oh my god this water this is the best water it's it's water it came out of a faucet <laughs> and it is water so just because you drink it doesn't mean i'm gonna buy it so i really think that that ship has sailed and i feel like anybody doing it now is it's it's almost like stupid for anybody doing it i'm sorry i didn't mean that to or they're making a lot of money they're making or a lot of money, money. Or or they're they're right, a lot but, money. but there's a there it, truly but there's a lot of in between there that it's just like it's overkill and, and i just feel like people are just over it so maybe they're not i don't know maybe i just want to be uh something i tell designers i won't work with a designer or a brand that um does not have in their contract that they have a photographer do every single project um, that's something that I, there are assets that you need. At the end of the day, Instagram could go away, and you don't own your Instagram, but what you do own is your portfolio, your site, your content, your stuff, so make sure that's the best as it can be. That's what I would say. That's my two cents on that. Yeah. Um, I want to end, yeah, we ended? We're doing it, right? I want to end with one very important question, which is what's your go-to karaoke song? <laughs> I want to hear what this song is. <laughs> I'm waiting. Mine is Last Two Dollars by Johnny Taylor. The only song I've ever sung karaoke was Love Shack. <laughs> <laughs> it's up to you, New York. New York. That's mine. Thank you, everyone, for coming out. <laughs>